The American Revolution was a people's war. Men, women, and children took part in it. Damn, where my died. Each citizen soldier was provided with a musket and a cartridge box and was expected to be ready to fight whenever called. As part of America's fight for freedom, women did things they hadn't done before. They ran farms and businesses, sewed clothes for soldiers, and helped make gunpowder and cannonballs. Some even used weapons. Mary Hagedorn refused orders to hide in a basement during the British assault upon Fort Washington in New York City. I shall not go to that cellar should the enemy come. I will take a spear, which I can use as well as any man, and help defend the fort. Also fighting on the American side were about 5,000 African Americans. While we are not allowed the privilege of free men, many of our color have cheerfully entered the field of battle in defense of the common cause. But for other American blacks, it was a different story. Why should they fight for a nation that allowed slavery? A Massachusetts clergyman named John Allen pointed out the irony of asking blacks to fight. Blush, ye pretended freedom fighters. You are making a mockery of your profession of being advocates for the liberties of mankind, while at the same time trampling on the sacred rights of Africans. Slavery was, of course, the great contradiction to American liberty in this period. And it existed in all the colonies. There was slavery in New York, in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, of a smaller scale than in the South. Slaves were property. They were a recognized form of property, both in the British Empire and in America. The revolution makes some people think of this as a contradiction, but that's really the first time that it becomes a major public issue. The war for independence lasted nearly nine years. Great Britain had the most feared army in the world. And in battle after battle, the Americans were badly beaten. In 1777, the British captured America's capital city, Philadelphia, as Congress fled. 18 miles from the city, General Washington marched his army to Valley Forge. It was December, and the ground was covered with snow. Dr. Albigens Waldo of Connecticut wrote in his diary about the Continental Army's misery. December 12th, we are ordered to march over the river. It snows, I'm sick. Eat nothing, no whiskey, no baggage. Lord, Lord, Lord. The American troops at Valley Forge lived in dirt-floored, drafty wooden huts lined up in streets like a village. Some of the soldiers had no shoes, their toes froze, and their feet left bloody tracks. December 14th, poor food, hard lodging, cold weather, fatigue, nasty clothes, nasty cookery, vomit half my time, I can't endure it. Here comes a bowl of beef soup, 
full of burnt leaves and dirt. At Valley Forge, General Washington shared in his men's hardships. And when he asked them to stand by him, they did. My brave fellows, you have done all I asked you to do, and more than could be reasonably expected. But your country is at stake. Your wives, your houses, and all you hold dear. You have worn yourself out, but I know not how to spare you. Let freedom reign. No battles were fought at Valley Forge, but something important happened there. The men who made it through that winter became a team, strong, confident, and proud of themselves and of their cause. If we had a secret resource, a nature unknown to our enemy, it was in the unconquerable resolution of our citizens, the conscious rectitude of our cause, and a confident trust that we should not be forsaken by heaven. As the war continued, the odds often seemed insurmountable. The English had more fighting men, more guns, more experience. Not then organized as a nation, we had no preparations. The resources of the British were inexhaustible. But the Americans fought on and on for their freedom. In 1781 came the most important battle of the war at a Virginia river port called Yorktown. The French had joined the war on America's side. Now their ships drove off the British fleet in Chesapeake Bay. The French and American armies then moved into Yorktown, quietly dug trenches around the British forces at night, and in the morning, the British were outnumbered and outflanked. On October 17, 1781, the English general, Lord Cornwallis, surrendered. It would have been wanton and inhuman to sacrifice this body of soldiers by exposing them to an assault. Two days later, American soldiers stood proudly in a long line. Facing them was a line of French soldiers. The defeated British soldiers tried to keep their heads high as they marched between them, but many cried when they laid down their arms. The Revolutionary War was over. An upstart colony had defeated a superpower. A new nation was being formed, a nation ruled by laws, not kings, a nation founded on the ideas of equality and freedom. The first American government was just too weak. The Articles of Confederation, the country's governing document, didn't give Congress the power to do much of anything. James Madison was a former congressman from Virginia. If some very strong props are not applied, the present system will tumble to the ground. In 1787, an emergency convention was called to overhaul the deeply flawed Articles of Confederation. It was James Madison who got the convention organized and convinced it to create a whole new constitution. The 55 delegates who met in Philadelphia had to be strong to make it through that hot, hot summer. Flies and mosquitoes bit right through their silk stockings. The delegates were divided, disagreeing over who should have power. Some delegates wanted the states to be strong. Others were for a strong national government. And then there was the question of the presidency. How much power should the chief executive have? Each of these objects was pregnant with difficulties. The whole of them together formed a task more difficult than can be well conceived. Benjamin Franklin sat patiently and listened. He realized that there was one issue on which nearly everyone disagreed, and it had to do with the relative power of the small and the large states and how each would be represented in Congress. The small states contend that their liberties will be in danger. The larger states say their money will be in danger. And neither side would budge. By June 30th, the convention was stalled. 
It was Roger Sherman of Connecticut who came up with a compromise that has affected the rest of American history. The idea was there should be not one, but two houses of Congress. One house would reflect a state's population. It would become the House of Representatives. A second house would have an equal number of representatives from each state. That house would become the U.S. Senate. That simple solution, that compromise, meant there would be an American government. The whole community is big with expectation, and there can be no doubt but that the result will have a powerful effect on our destiny. When the Constitution finally came to be written, Governor Morris of Pennsylvania composed the opening words. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. It goes on to say that the purpose of the Constitution is to secure the blessings of liberty for the people. Who are the people? Well, if you read the whole Constitution, you will discover that the people are not all of those living within the United States. First of all, there are Indians who are dealt with as separate entities. They are, in a sense, nations. that You deal with them by treaty. They're not uh, part of the American body politic. Then buried in the Constitution is the phrase, other persons. How can there be the people and other persons? Well, the other persons are the slaves. They're not part of the people. They don't have a voice in government. They're not entitled to the rights put forward in the Constitution. One would have to say that this was the greatest failure of the Founding Fathers in terms of statesmanship. But if the Founders were not prepared to eliminate slavery, many of them were ready to make a start. And those three words, we the people, would keep pushing the nation to one day include all people. James Wilson of Pennsylvania was proud of his involvement. It gives me great pleasure that so much was done. I consider this as laying the foundation for banishing slavery out of this country. Finally, on September 17th, the Constitution was finished and ready to be signed. As 81-year-old Benjamin Franklin put his signature on the parchment, tears streamed down his old cheeks. It astonishes me to find this system approaching so near to perfection. I think it will astonish our enemies. It was April 14, 1789, and the Constitution had finally been ratified. At Mount Vernon, George Washington's plantation home in Virginia, the 57-year-old general was handed a letter telling him he had been chosen as president of the brand new Union of States. He would need to depart for his inauguration on the very next morning. About 10 o'clock, I bade farewell to Mount Vernon and to private life. And with a mind oppressed with more anxious and painful sensations that I have words to express, set out for New York. It took Washington eight days to make the 235-mile journey to New York, which was to be the capital until a new one could be built. All along the way, citizens greeted their president-elect with parades and bonfires and fireworks and speeches and banquets. At his swearing in at New York's Federal Hall, Washington promised to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. I walk on untrodden ground. There is scarcely any part of my conduct which may not hereafter be drawn into precedent. Right away, Washington appointed advisors who became known as the Cabinet. He picked the very best people he could find. For Secretary of State, he chose Thomas Jefferson. For Secretary of the Treasury, it was Alexander Hamilton. What developed were the nation's first political parties. Jefferson and his followers became known as Democratic Republicans. Hamilton and his followers became known as Federalists. What they really represent is a, two competing visions of what the future of the country ought to be, and freedom is related to that. The Federalists want a powerful national state with a developing economy, sort of modeled on Great Britain. To them, freedom comes through national greatness and economic development. 
to the Jeffersonians, they want a limited government. They want America to be a land-based power, not a financial power and a military power. To them, freedom means limited government, individual opportunity. So in a sense, unlike some other periods in our history, the parties really represent very, very different visions of what America ought to be. George Washington's successor was his vice president, John Adams of Massachusetts. In earlier years, Adams had been a strong voice for liberty, but as president, one of his first acts was a damaging blow to American freedom. In 1798, amidst heightened concern for national security, Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Bills, sending them to President Adams for his signature. The Alien Bill made it difficult for people to become U.S. citizens and allowed the president to throw any foreigners he wanted out of the country. The Sedition Bill went even further. It made it a crime for Americans to criticize their government. Thomas Jefferson was outraged. If this goes down, we shall immediately see another act of Congress declaring that the president shall continue in office for life. It is an experiment to see how far Americans will bear violation of the Constitution. One man who could not bear such violation was Congressman Matthew Lyon of Vermont. Lyon was an independent man, wild and possessing a hot temper. Once he publicly attacked another congressman with fireplace tongs. Now he said President Adams was acting like a king and should be sent to a madhouse. President Adams has a continual grasp for power and an unbounded thirst for pomp. Men of real merit are daily turned out of office for no cause other than independence of sentiment. Under the Sedition Act, Lyon got arrested and convicted and sent to jail in the wilds of Vermont. Congress and the president had done something the Constitution said they couldn't do. They were restricting freedom of speech and of the press, and Americans didn't like it. In 1800, amidst widespread opposition to the Alien and Sedition Acts, Thomas Jefferson was elected the country's third president. He called his victory a revolution. The revolution of 1800 was as real as that of 1776 not affected indeed by the sword, but by the rational and peaceable instrument of reform, the suffrage of the people. The new president, Thomas Jefferson, hailed from a Virginia estate called Monticello. He was a gracious country gentleman with the belief in people's natural goodness. The people can be trusted with their own government. Whenever things get so far wrong as to attract their notice, they may be relied upon to set them to rights. In the newly built White House, Thomas Jefferson became one of the most visionary presidents ever. In a bold executive move going beyond his stated powers, he ordered the government to buy all French territory in North America. It cost $15 million and was called the Louisiana Purchase and it doubled the nation's size. Jefferson called it a vast new empire for liberty. In seizing Louisiana, I have done an act beyond the Constitution, but it is incumbent on those who accept great charges to risk themselves on great occasions. The new land stretched from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains and maybe beyond. No one was sure how far it went so someone had to find out what had been bought. Jefferson commissioned an expedition. He chose two men to lead the exploration. His shy personal secretary, Meriwether Lewis, a dreamer and lover of science, and a good-natured, talkative soldier and map maker named William Clark. The object of your mission is to explore the Missouri River and the water offering the best communication with the Pacific Ocean. Your observations are to be taken with great pains and accuracy. In 1804, Lewis and Clark went up the Missouri River in a 55-foot flatboat and two canoes. They moved slowly, mapping, exploring, and hunting as they went. It was dangerous country with unexpectedly high mountains, difficult deserts, many animals they had never seen before. 
and Indians. Lewis and Clark were prepared for danger, but they were not prepared for the beauty, for the colors of wildflowers, or the brilliance of sunsets on mountain peaks, or for the great falls of the Missouri River. I saw the spray rise like a column of smoke. The projecting rocks below received the water in its passage down and break it into a perfect white foam, which assumes a thousand forms. We have penetrated the continent of North America and have discovered the most practicable route across it. America was born of an idea and a dream. The dream was of a paradise, a land of great beauty that would attract people from around the world. The idea was freedom. Americans are not the only people in the world who love freedom, obviously, but it does seem to play a particularly central role in our political vocabulary and consciousness. I think this arises from two things. One, the fact that this is a nation that was founded by people in the 1770s who proclaimed this an asylum for liberty, an emblem of freedom for the entire world. So in, in our very birth as a nation, the notion of freedom is built into the meaning of the society. But on the other hand, it's also central to us because we have seen struggles throughout our history by excluded groups to gain access to the blessings of liberty. Our history is a history of continual struggle over the meaning of freedom and for greater and greater freedom. And as long as those struggles go on, the idea of freedom will be, continue to be central to American life. Let freedom reign. Let freedom reign. Let it reign. Well, I wish I could be like.